in chess, in order to improve, you need to uh, improve your weaknesses. I think that's pretty uncontroversial. And my, uh, perhaps my greatest weakness right now is calculation. So what I decided to do is pick up this massive tome called the Encyclopedia of Chess Combinations and um, otherwise known as EOCC, uh, sixth edition, uh, hot off the presses this year, 2021. Uh, chock full of um, modern examples um, from this past year, even even some some online events from the Champions Chess Tour. So, what is a combination? A combination is um, related to a tactic, uh, but a tactic prioritizes a single um, pattern. I would say um, both prioritize well, both make use of pattern recognition and and improve your pattern recognition skills. But combinations, I would say, have the potential to contain more than one. Uh, pattern, which um, is part of the sequence of moves that make it up. So <clears throat> combinations, uh, there are about 3,000 of them in this thing, um, over 3,000 and uh, 724, 734 pages. Um, the first edition was in 1980, it's by Chess Informant, um, established in 1966. Uh, the first edition was only 351 pages, so it's it's uh, approximately doubled since then, and it, it feels like a lifetime investment. I'm really excited to to really break into it because right now I've done like eight puzzles and um, a couple of them myself, but mostly with my friend Nico. After a long rapid tournament, we were crazy enough to go to a pub and um, and set up a board and. Um, a timer and compare our answers afterwards. That's, that's a good way to approach it, I think. If you have a friend uh, who is a similar strength to you, um, who you can preferably set up a board with and, and you know, pretend you're in a game, um, give yourself the pressure of time and compare your answers afterwards, I think that's a, a healthy approach. That's the way I'm gonna continue to try to do it, whether it's over the board um, with a friend in person or, um, or remotely. All right, so let's get right into the book. I want to uh, give you an overview of the contents of the book, uh, after which we can set up a position, a random position from the book, and uh, try to solve it to get together. I'm going to read you the preface, uh, just so you can get an introduction from the author. Well, I, I think it's a it's a collaboration um, for from different people at Chess Informant. I don't think there's one author for this thing. Um, but anyway, here's the editorial preface. <clears throat> Dear readers, the book you're holding in your hands, by the way, before we move on, this is also a chessable course that's coming out. Um, I did quality control for the for the course. It's freaking massive. Uh, I don't envy the, the person who had to import the, this course, um, but you can look forward to it uh, being released on chessable soon. Uh, Dear readers, the book you're holding in your hands has an extraordinary history and development over the last 40 years. The first edition of the Encyclopedia of Middle Games, Combinations, was published um, in 1980, which was its first iteration, and ever since it has been a favorite training tool for aspiring chess students, trainers, and of course professionals. After the first edition, each subsequent one was enriched with new instructive examples. Special care was taken that all the most interesting uh, examples keep their place in the book throughout its evolution. I can proudly point out that the sixth edition, uh, which is this one, of our classic Encyclopedia of Chess Combinations, sixth edition, ECC6, contains examples and instructive positions from games played by all world champions, from Steinitz to Carlson. Also, in this edition of the Encyclopedia, we kept the standard division of all the themes and tactical motifs into ten topics, which I will list in a second, while uh, all the positions are graded in three levels according to play, uh, playing strength, basic, intermediate, and advanced. Therefore, the book should prove to be extremely useful for chess trainers, allowing them to choose the examples and difficulty uh, and level of difficulty based on their students' knowledge and progress. So yeah, it can be used as a coach as well to, to give your students instructive material. Uh, so the themes included are as follows. Annihilation of the defense, which is like removing the defender. There's some fancier like versions of these common uh, motifs. Um, two is blockade. Uh, we got clearance, deflection, discovered attack, pinning, demolition of the pawn structure, decoy, interference, double attack. Okay, and that's the last one, double attack. So apparently these are the themes that sort of all combinations fit into somewhere. 
And um, again, within each theme, um, there are sometimes hundreds of, of uh, combinations um, for different levels, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. So um, right now, let's open in a random page. Okay, that was random. Uh, deflection, we got basic deflection. Okay, so this is puzzle number 1014. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it up here on the board I have it in front of me. Uh, this board just happens to exist here at the, the co-working space I go to. Um, so I'm gonna set up um, the position on this board and I'm gonna think while I um, give you this position as well on a board uh, that will appear next to me so you can think alongside me. And yeah, I, I don't think I'll bore you with how long I'm thinking. I think I'll make it a time lapse and um, I'll let you know how long I thought and um, yeah, we can compare our answers together. Okay, so just for some context, um, again, this is a deflection tactic. It's supposed to be basic, although take that with a grain of salt. These are all very difficult, I think. Um, I, I've done some of the basic ones already, and it's not like your basic tactics. It's uh, basic combinations are a different animal. Um, especially how they're uh, graded in this book. Uh, and this is a game between Sidez Zade and Polishuk. I don't, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it's a correspondence game from 1978. And um, it's black to move here, actually. Um, I'm gonna just flip the board. And um, okay, so it's black to move in this position. And if you'd like to have a think for yourself, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep a notebook and write down all the variations that are relevant in the calculation, like all the variations you would need to see in order to go for the line. Um, and I recommend you do the same and I'll start a time lapse of me thinking. Um, it'll, chances are it'll end before you're done thinking. So at that point you can pause the video or right after I'm done talking and um, we'll compare our answers afterwards. Good luck. Okay guys, so I just finished. Um, I'm happy with my answer. Uh, I actually took uh, 15 to 20 minutes on that. I think I didn't, I forgot to time myself, but yeah. So here's here's the process and here's the process I recommend you use when you, um, when you try to calculate a combination. You start with the material count, then you look at your opponent's threats. You see what um, your opponent is threatening in the position so that you know sort of, um, you can gauge how much time you have to carry out your own idea. And um, what you really wanna, what I wanna emphasize you do when you calculate is you steel man your opponent's ideas. And what I mean by steel manning is you always consider what uh, your opponent's best possible reply to your moves are on every single move. Um, so that means really putting yourself in your opponent's shoes and being super stubborn uh, about your own ideas and basically trying to make your own ideas fail. That's the key to calculation, I think, is uh, that, that, that's how you, you, you um, prevent yourself from missing your opponent's resources because this is often how you lose a game. You, you didn't see your opponent could do this and so like you really don't win a piece. You just sac sacrificed uh, a pawn for nothing. So, um, so, Okay, I'm gonna explain, well here, first I'll show you what I wrote down, basically. Uh, these are the notes for the video, but like all of this, this is the, uh, these are the annotation, the, the no this is the notation of the combinations that I um, came up with. Um, and I'm excited to compare my answer with a book. Um, 
I'm gonna do that real quick. And then when I come back, I'm going to sort of give a brief overview of the puzzle uh, and see how you did. Okay, well, that was disappointingly short. I'll show you the, um, the length of the answer in the book. It's under 1014. Uh, let's see if I can point it out right here, where my thumb, or my uh, middle finger is here. That's how long the solution is in the book. And you can see there's a wide variety of lengths of solutions. But I wrote way more than the book did, which I think is a good sign uh, because it means I, even if it wasn't strictly necessary to calculate, which I still think it is, um, to see the variations that I actually wrote down, um, it's better to have more, uh, have considered more than less. So um, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the position. And um, Yeah, so the first move that came to mind, like within five seconds of looking, of looking at the position, was in fact the correct first move, bishop d7. And uh, I mean, we have the advantage of knowing that the theme is deflection right off the bat, so that helps. And I also noticed very quickly that the white king is um, pretty exposed, close to the center of the board, and um, the white pieces are sort of miscoordinated. And um, what's more is the, the black major pieces are sort of ready to spring into the attack against the white king. So uh, we need to find a way to, um, number one, stop um, white's threat of just advancing these pawns forward. Namely, uh, I think white next move wants to go uh, d2, or sorry, d7, uh, and then queen one of the pawns, or both. So um, this move bishop d7 actually prevents white's threat while advancing our own plan. So again, I'm gonna reiterate the, the process I went through to, to do this. I started with the material count. We can notice that uh, it's, it's four pawns to four. Um, two of white's pawns are very far advanced, so that's one imbalance to note. Um, black's king is relatively safe. There's some back ring possibilities, but white's uh, king is pretty exposed. Um, the otherwise we're uh, up in exchange and so black is technically up material so next we look at our opponent's threats which as i said is um d7 i believe so the first moves that come to mind um could be moves that uh, parry this threat um and otherwise i don't think white has much to speak of if i mean really all of White's position comes down to whether he can advance these pawns because he's already down material and his king is exposed, so he doesn't really have much else to bank on. Um, and then the last thing um, to keep in mind during the calculation is to, and I got this from uh, Andras Toth, who's a, a great um, you know, coach, well-known streamer. Um, he actually made a video where he, he emphasized this, um, this philosophy of basically trying to disprove your own ideas when you calculate, because this is really how you, um, how you don't miss things. So the first move that, that came to mind was bishop d7, and I, I spent the majority of my time looking at the follow-ups, um, and one error I had <laughs> right off the bat was I noticed that, I mean, obviously the, the follow-up to bishop d7, queen d7, is queen c5, uh, check. And white's king can run one of two ways. It can either go to b3 or to d3. If it goes to b3, I thought I had seen correctly that I could just go uh, queen c4 check, king a3, and king a4 checkmate. But then later, when I was calculating some other lines, it sort of just hit me that there's a bishop on c2. So no, I can't go queen a4 checkmate. Um, I have to find another refutation to king b3. So then I saw uh, queen c5, uh, check, king b3, queen c4, check, king a3, uh, b4, check, forces king a4. And then we have, um, we have just b3 check, 
um, which is just discovered check. Uh, white has to move the king, and then we can take the bishop. We probably have other stronger moves as well. Like, I even looked at uh, B takes a, uh, A2 there, which is interesting. I think white has to go rook E1 to stop the uh, pawn from promoting. But, um, but yeah, I, I think stronger is probably just to take the bishop. And uh, so that's winning for black. But I only saw that later, so it's important to try to be as accurate as possible from the outset so that you don't have to come back to things. So I sort of got lucky there. Um, okay, so the next line I looked at was bishop d7, queen d7, uh, queen c5 check, and, uh, and king d3. Because if queen d2 right away, we just take the knight, but still on... Um, on king d3, we just go queen c4 check, uh, forcing king d2, after which we just take the knight and probably mating very quickly. Um, so it became clear after seeing these mating ideas that um, black's best option is probably to decline the, the, the offer of the bishop on d7. So after bishop d7, uh, I started looking at queen b6 and queen e4. Queen e4 leads to the same uh, queen, uh, queen c5 stuff. Uh, the knight's a little better defended, but um, we're going to deliver a rook check on f7. It's not going to be very fun. For example, um, after queen e4, queen c5 check, king d3, queen c5, or sorry, queen c4 check, king d2, um, rook f7 check. Um, actually, no, we don't even need to go rook f7, we just go rook takes uh, d6. And that uh, comes with an attack on the knight, uh, threatens a, a fork on the queen, and... So, the most critical line, uh, and according to the book as well, is queen b6. So, bishop d7, queen b6. And, um, yeah, I, I thought for quite a while here about what the best continuation would be. But I ended up settling on the same plan of trying to get my queen to, to c4 and deliver check and harass the king. So I went queen, d5, uh, queen d5 with the idea of queen c4, and this turned out to be the, uh, the book's answer as well. So pretty happy about, about this. I, I could have calculated a little bit faster. Again, I think it took me 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I saw the correct move right away, and I was like 99% sure that this was the answer. But I just wanted to be thorough and make sure, because in a game, <laughs> You don't know that uh, you're not given the theme of deflection. Um, you're going to need to really make sure all of your lines are um, foolproof before going for this first move. So, so that's enough calculation for right now. Let me just um, show you the book before I end the video. Um, basically, uh, this, for example, is kind of what the majority of the book looks like. Just a, a shit ton of puzzles, basically. This is the clearance chapter, as you see. Is this clear? Yeah, clearance. Uh, and it's the basic section. Yeah, just making sure what I'm pointing at is, is accurate, that it's too small to see on my screen. Um, and the answers look like this, once again. And some of them are extremely long, like this is, uh, this is an intermediate section. So you can see the length of some of the solutions is kind of unreal. And again, some of them are kind of computer-esque, but I think it's very good practice even to learn like computer-esque lines. I mean, it'll help you see them. Yeah, um, I'm very happy with this investment. I'm excited to, to continue. I think it's a great way to learn, especially with a training partner. And uh, I hope you um, took some instructive points away from the method um, I used to calculate, um, as well as this puzzle itself. So again, uh, this course is coming out on Chessable pretty soon. So keep your eyes open for that. And um, yeah, thanks for tuning into the video. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content and looking forward to seeing you next time. Cheers.